The Inner Sanctum presents the Wednesday Whip Around. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inner Sanctum. This is the second edition of the Wednesday Whip Around, and I'm joined this week by two prestigious young men from the Inner Sanctum. It's the founder himself, the guy that's wearing the bars. That's right. It's Jack <laughs> Hudson. Hello, welcome to the Wednesday Whip Around. Oh, g'day, man. Oh, it's good to be here, mate. It is really good to be here. Another one of the um, Sanctum's children really here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the founder and also the child care centre. Um, Grats. Touche. It's good to have you on, mate. Uh, my fellow Stormin, welcome to the Wednesday Whip Around, mate. How are you? Uh, uh, it's always good to come after a long day helping the retail folk and talking some sport with two esteemed Adelaide gentlemen as such as yourselves. Gee, oh. that, that's, that's the best intro we're ever going to have, Ant. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Thomas that is... If I could be introduced any other way, that's going to be it. Um, mm. And speaking of to Adelaide loyal, Port Adelaide fans, we might as well just get straight into the first topic. And Hutto, you brought this one to my attention because just recently the Inner Sanctum posted an article up, uh, from Michael Andrew Ridgely himself talking about the bars. Enlighten us and tell us about this story, mate. Well... It's in reaction to um, a dear friend of the Sanctums, actually, Graham Corns' um, article in the Advertiser saying about um, why Port Adelaide shouldn't wear the bars and how it's nothing compared to the Sydney-South Melbourne situation, how they're going to wear the South Melbourne Guernsey in all matches in Victoria, which is sensational. But I'll just make it clear. We have no issue with that. We are the Embrace Club being able to celebrate their history and their heritage and everything like that. It's just a bit of why not us? So, basically, um, Roots has just gone through and uh, just torn most of Fawnsy's, um opinion of fa- um, apart and just gone, nah, this is where it all sorts of, sort of works. So, like, yeah, we're delighted for the Swans. Like, as Port fans, we are delighted for the Swans and it's a damn good jumper. I love that South Melbourne jumper. It's very nice. But um, why not us? Grats. Mate, tell us about the the South Mel- the Melbourne Guernsey. How how important is it to the Sydney um, Sydney culture? And you as a fan as well, you must be pretty proud to see that be become pretty much a staple now in every Melbourne uh, game you get to play. Well, I think well, I've always been a fan of it, and it obviously it was a very occasional thing early on, and then of course during last year when the Swans were on the road again it became sort of just a, a staple for the uh, Swans attire and it really helped the uh, fans feel like they were more involved because we ended up, we ended up, actually ended up playing most of our games back in Melbourne in the last, I think, seven or so games of the year. So it was just very special to see the Swans honour that with our South Melbourne heritage because we've, oh, and we've always been very strong in tied with our South Melbourne heritage Ever since, I think about twenty five years or so, probably probably longer. But once we truly embrace that heritage, like the difference in the club's fortunes has just been night and day. And that's why I'm more than proud to see it continue. But also because the jumper is so incredibly awesome, and I'm so glad that we get to see more of it. And as a Swans fan in Melbourne, it means I'll always get to see it when I get to see my team in action. Yeah, that, that would um that would excite me. Hutto, when you saw the announcement um for Sydney uh, uh, being allowed to wear the Guernsey, what was your first reaction? Uh, first reaction was, well, Twitter's going to be fun today. It's <laughs> 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 so, like, so, so, oh, here come the Crows fans, here come the Collingwood fans, and here come everyone that is absolutely sick to death of me talking about it. But, but I was just like, okay, here's another point of, it just makes sense. Like, I'm just, why not? It, it's great. I, I love heritage being embraced. It's awesome. We need to. And it, like I've said before, sensational Guernsey. So my first reaction was, yeah, well, Twitter's going to be fun today and I'm going to argue this to the cows come home. My yeah, first well, reaction, to be honest, was uh, Hutto's going to be fun today. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally waiting to see what Hutto was going to write and then I just react to it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm, ex- I'm exactly the same because I knew the second something like this come out, I just knew Hutto would be 
right on. Like, yep, okay. So, what about us? Literally, when, to be honest, when... that's actually a very that's actually a very good point. It feels like they are dancing around the issue by allowing mm-hmm. such a thing to occur. I was pleasantly surprised, and when I was scrolling Facebook, that's when I first saw it. I instantly went to Twitter, and I Hutto was the first one that pops up, uh, and I was just <laughs> like, "This is." It's almost like when you play footy and you're playing such a good game of football in the bees and everyone ignores your form and you don't get picked. Like with there's 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 like a, there's a bit of history, obviously. But there's also proof that it works, proof that it's successful. 2020, we sold that was the most sold merch by any AFL club, wasn't it, Hutto? I believe so, bars. yeah. Yep. I believe so. Number one that was sold at our uh, the port store, and the, it, it, it's it's nothing but positive for the AFL as an image. Like I don't understand how a, a club like Collingwood can stand up and say it, it downs their image when you know we're in a position where it's nothing but positive for the AFL for the fans, and it's one game a bloody year, or even two because <laughs> it's both showdowns. I think we're angling for as well. And what's yeah. and what's more and what's interesting to me is now because Sydney are wearing that uh, heritage jersey at every at every Victorian game, like that's even more than what Port are asking. So technically, we've been given like almost double, hell, even triple what Port are asking for, and it just it defies all logic, to be honest. Yeah, but that's. It, we're, if we could get a minimum of one game, that's fantastic. But this, the Swans are getting six or seven Victorian games. It, it, it's just double standards. And that's a great point. Like, there's so much more games with that Guernsey than what Port's asking for. And it's a home game for us, too. Like, if we yeah, can get the a one... The AFL has like, accidentally manu- manufactured a rivalry between Sydney and Port Adelaide over a Guernsey. Yeah. <laughs> so that's... When, um, when it comes up, Port are actually going to request the three games, the two showdowns, and when we play the Swans, you guys will mm. wear the South Melbourne Guernsey and we wear the bars. <laughs> and, and the winner gets to keep, and winner gets to keep theirs permanently. Exactly. Oh, that's a great. You know what, though? Uh, that would be although that's a, probably, although that's probably not a good deal for us. We haven't beaten Port in about five years. Yeah, Scotty Lysette. Oh, yeah. what a game. Ali Ali. Oh, that was... We even beat oh, the trade what I, the, what I, oh, <laughs> what I, uh, <laughs> but, I but, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually looking forward to playing Port again this year because naturally this issue is going to come up that week. And, uh, and I think it's also good because last year's Sydney Port game was the one, first, like, one that I w- go back and say, yep, that was, a, that was a brilliant game, right? And I haven't said that about a Sydney Port game for quite a while. Not since um, 2013, 14, at the uh, SCG. 14. Snags. Yeah, Buddy's 100-metre bombs or whatever they were. Give him a longer contract. <laughs> <laughs> Deary me. Oh. Have you heard, actually, speaking of Buddy, before we, we go into uh, a, a different topic, unless Hutto's got anything to add, but Buddy, have you heard anything? How's he tracking this preseason? He's Obviously, you're going to be adding uh, for a thousand goals this year. Interesting. Interestingly, I haven't heard that much about him, which is, mm. which can be a good thing. It means he's after the after last year, where, when I was just hoping he'd get back on the park, and he ended up inching ever so clo- ever so closer to that magical thousand goals mark. So he's been actually very quiet on the injury front so far. I th- I do think he I do think. Like, if I'm being honest, I'd be surprised if he doesn't get a run in the practice game on Friday. But, yeah, it's interesting to um, not have heard much from him. Hey, uh, Hutto, did you yeah. see what um, Ben Dixon said about uh, Buddy Franklin today? Uh, no, I did not. Can you please inform me? He, he said, and I quote, that he should, Buddy should get to 1,000 goals and then Sydney should put him on ice until finals. That would be incredibly stupid and arrogant and, and very assuming. That is That's literally the. That is literally the. I mean, he could kick five goals round one. He could very well do it. I, I mean, personally, I don't think he will, but he could. 
So he, Ben Deeson is suggesting, let's say he does kick five goals round one. Are we going to rest him for 20 weeks and then hope we make finals and then be like, oh, bud, you're back in? <laughs> yeah. it, it just logically wouldn't work because it's also you need um, you need match fitness. You need match fitness and you need sort of in momentum. It's like, oh, yeah, haven't played for 20 weeks just because they're get the boys and fresh legs in and then I'll wheel it out for finals and I'll, I'll take it from here. What a stupid idea. That's like us resting Robbie Gray. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. And also, and also it's a re- huge slap in the face because if we're resting Buddy, it means one of our young forwards gets that uh, full forward role. Then all of a sudden he's basically called, hey, thanks for getting us here, mate. Now off to the twos with you, Buddy's coming back. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hutto, do you have anything else you'd like to add about the bars? Just bring him back. Time's a ticking. Not long till showdown. Get it going. Hey, how about that? Uh, the fixture reveal, that video that Port put up a couple of weeks, well, a couple yes. of weeks before the end of last year. They had the fifth guarantee they were allowed to wear with a question mark. Mm. Could you imagine that? They just like, keep spruiking it and they, they actually know, but just haven't told anyone. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what, like I've said to you um, privately, as soon as that gets ticked off, we are going to be best. I, I wouldn't want to be on Twitter that day. No, no. I'll, I'll, I'll see my follower catch go. <laughs> <laughs> the inner sanctum will be well and truly ahead of you after that. Yeah, I, 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 as, as, it, as, it should be, as it should be. Hey, Anthony. <laughs> 100%. No man is bigger than one big, happy, sanctum family. Exactly. Unless you're Hutto. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of preseason footy and uh, Buddy playing on Friday, it starts today, Wednesday. Um, a lot of preseason footy, a lot of talk about it, and all the internal trials and everything has happened. A lot of key. Um, players coming back, a lot of key players missing. Boys, give us a bit of a preview. Uh, I'll start with you, Hutto. Give mm-hmm. us a bit of a preview of uh, the preseason games leading into the Amy um, preseason games and then round one not long after. Yeah, obviously, they're not really at friendly time slots, I'd say a lot of them, which is um, really unfortunately like we play at, what is it, I think 2.40 on Sunday, which is just... On Friday, yeah. Friday, Friday, sorry which is really just prim. So Essendon play the Bulldogs, which is um, really exciting. And one for us Port fans to be watching, Tex Wanganin is playing performance in that game. Oh, he, yeah. He's after that last slot on the Bombers list, which would be sensational. It'll be even better when we get him in a couple of years. Um, so the Essendon <laughs> Bulldogs game will be wicked. I'm very excited to um, see that, especially it'll probably be... I, I don't know if it'd be too much of a grudge, grudge match, but obviously it was last year's elimination final and like some decisions were a bit how you're going. So um, it'll be an interesting to watch. It's at the hangar, so that'll be great. Thursday footy, 10 a.m. for Carlton Saints, Melbourne North at 11. No worries. I hope you're not working that day. <laughs> Fans of those clubs. That's got some real under, under 19s reserves vibes. Yeah, actually. So interesting to see how the Blues go. Um, and the Saints, like two real underachievers last year. Obviously, new coach of Carlton, our old boy, Bossy. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they do differently, how that um, backline dynamic sort of goes without Liam Jones there for the, for the Blues. And I don't think Harry Mackay is playing either. So, um, be interesting to see. And Melbourne North Melbourne, we're not going to learn too much out of that, I don't think. We'll see Jason Horn Francis hopefully just light it up. But we're watching the reigning premier against the Wooden Spoon and like we're not gonna to learn too much about either side really, unless North have just suddenly improved out of sight and Melbourne have just crashed and burned, which I doubt. Um Brisbane and the Crom. Um at ten AM Metricon as a double header before um, the real show, which is uh Port and the Gold Coast. <laughs> we'll see how the Gold Coast goes without um Ben King, who's um obviously injured his knee. So see how that forward line don't, dynamic goes and obviously a lot of um, pressure on the Suns this year, especially should we do with Clarko waiting in the wings. Collingwood Hawthorne, interesting to see how they go under two new coaches. Sydney and the Giants. Um, hope the Giants get up just so someone in this school is very unhappy. 
Um, <laughs> West Coast Frio, because neither of them can leave the uh, People's Republic of Western Australia. And <laughs> <laughs> five games on a Friday, then Geelong and Richmond at GMHBA. So they've actually literally got the only good time slot across the whole comp. So right. interesting to I see know, how... I want to know how... I want to know how they've got that one. Mm. Interesting to see how both Geelong and Richmond go. You know, in my in my opinion, Cartland and Kilda is a very intriguing contest as they are both two teams who, in my opinion, underachieved in twenty twenty one, and will be wanting to get that get back into the finals opinion. So I want to know who do you guys reckon will finish higher in twenty twenty two? Oh. Um, I'll, I'll go first. I'm going to say the Blues. I'll say Carl will finish higher than St. Kilda. You know, uh, Anthony? I put out my uh, predictions video on the pair yesterday. No, two days ago, sorry. Um, and I have Carlton in the eight ahead of St. Kilda. You have Carlton in the eight? So, I have Carlton in the eight. I think... Um, I don't know. This year's going to throw up a lot of spanners. Um, it's about whether or not people make them work. And um, I think Carlton somehow will just make it click. And I just thank you. They always, you always think they'll do well and then they they spit in your face a little bit. So mm. well, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how that pans out. But Carlton, I've got a lot of, yeah, a lot of positive energy around them at the moment. I hope, you know, when Sam Mosh comes back from his injury and and you know, Mackay, hopefully he's fit for round one. Don't forget, they're going to have, like, Charlie Kerno for a fully fit, full season, yep. unless he gets injured. But um, And they've got a lot of... Chara as well is in the side. A lot of depth coming around. Their defence is pretty solid with Weedering. Uh, no Liam Jones, but um, they've got a couple down there that still can stand up. So, we'll see. But I think, yep. yeah, the Blues. Congrats, right. you. Um... Um, I definitely am a bit bullish on the Blues, having living in a house with our two long-suffering Blues fans. It's been hard to sit back and watch them disappoint year after year. But this year, they've been given the easiest draw in the comp. And going through the list, if you were to place Carlton up against who they've, who they've got in like the first month, month and a half of the year, they really should be squaring the ledger at least. Mm. You've got Richmond, you've got uh, Gold Coast, you've got Hawthorne, you've got the Western Bulldogs, you've got Port Adelaide, and you've got North Melbourne and Fremantle. So that's that's definitely a very winnable games there. Like the only games that I would definitely not back them in against is uh, Western Bulldogs and your mob Port Adelaide. I was going to say, yeah. you're treading on very thin ice there. <laughs> and another one I want to talk about the Eagles. Obviously, old mate Kane came out this week and um, said he thinks bottom four. I tend to agree with him. I think so do I. I, yeah, I think the Eagles are actually going to fall off the face of the earth this year. But um, and obviously, there's a lot going on. Aging list, everything surrounding Jack Darling. It's just a recipe for disaster, it seems. Yeah, right. Death was yeah. uh, severely tested. I think at for a lot of uh, last year and it, it showed. And worse than that, their style of footy just doesn't cut it anymore. Their kick mark style was torn apart several times, most notably, I reckon, against uh, Sydney in uh, Geelong where we basically tore ribbons off them and that's 200 point losses against Geelong, which obviously we can say Geelong is the common den- denominator there, but the fact is, they looked well off the pace from most of the second half of the year with the last gasp win over Richmond and exception. So I reckon I'll have to agree with you guys there. Yeah. I, I, they don't have a lot of strong youth coming through. I know they've got Oscar Allen down forward. Um, but there's not a lot really that really stands out as well. Um, and as you said, Hello, ageing list. The game style I've heard from a couple of people that live over in WA, they've, they've gone for a more of an inside game, which to go from kick mark, kick mark to inside game in a game that's been dominated purely by that quick outside run footy seems a bit of, of a bit of a question mark going into this year. So 
I mean, they could all prove us wrong and finish top four. That's they do have the the, mm. the quality, but yeah, I just see them dropping. I, there's just, yep. they should have made finals last year, but they didn't. They dropped off the face of the earth. They got pumped, as you said, Gratz, and I just yeah can't see them doing much this year. Oh, well, they've got a short four points. They play us at Adelaide Oval, so oh, <laughs> don't even start. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I know. It's... If if you if you're uh, if you're um basically the core of your group is a house of cards and could fall apart with one or two injuries, then there is definitely um, worrying worrying signs ahead. Yeah. A lot absolutely. rests on Elliot, yo. Absolutely. All right, boys. Lastly, one final thing. I wanted to bring this up because it's a, it's a massive talking point in the F1 world. I know you boys aren't all over Formula 1, but it even caught your attention um, when you heard this. Last year, we know the, the final race of the Formula One season was won by Max Verstappen in controversial circumstances. Him winning on the last lap due to a call made by the F1 director himself, Michael Massey, who is an Australian boy. Got the sack last week for his, for his tough call. Now, a lot of people thought it was obviously a controversial call at the time, but to be sacking a bloke after, I wouldn't even call it a mistake. It was more theatre than anything. We've seen this in other genres of sport as well, where it almost becomes a bit of puppetry by the uh, by the big dogs, um, including Michael Massey. How do, how do you react to this in a way where it could happen in any sport? Well, that's a tough question. Because I remember going onto Twitter in the morning and just seeing everything just explode. And I think basically someone explained it as you're 100 points up and then someone goes, next goal wins. Mm. Is that basically the explanation? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Because um, to put it into context, you know, there was a crash with five laps to go. There was a safety car. Um, and the race in any other condition would have finished under safety car, which means Lewis Hamilton wins the race. Because this was the final race of the year, F1, the Michael Massey tried to do everything he could to make sure the race was uh, that had a, basically a one-lap dash to the end. It was most certainly theatre he did everything he did everything right right up until he only let five lapped cars through so these blokes are a lap behind they're in the mix of the grid so um it was lewis hamilton four lap cars and then max verstappen he's let the four lap cars that were behind hamilton through but didn't let the rest of the guys there was another six drivers mixed through the grid through to unlap themselves which means He's had an unfair advantage to the other guys that were still lapped, but he's also made this now an unfair advantage for Hamilton, who's on old tyres with one lap to go, and Max Verstappen pitted just before the safety car on fresh, quick tyres. So he's put this all on a plate and basically mixed up the salad and then tossed it out. And it ended up with Max Verstappen passing Hamilton and winning the championship with one lap to go. Yeah. So I kind of understand why he's been booted then, if that's the case. Like, to have a decision that's sort of controversial with that sort of analogy linked to it is actually insane. I, you just yeah. I understand like theatre and sport, but there's also screw jobs at the same time. On, oh, it's just a mess. It's just a, a mess. Like, and reading about how he's been let go, it just makes it even bigger, even an even bigger mess. Because now I've seen Mercedes fans who, who believe they were dealt ha- dealt harshly at the time. Right now, th- now thinking there are, you know, dealt even worse because now he's been let go as a result of this decision. Yeah, and and the other thing too is they've just recently, as of uh, just over the weekend, even changed the rules around this as well. They've they've taken away um, any sort of con- contact between the race director and um, team principals during races as well. So anything that's made by uh, the decision panel during a race uh, will stand, so no one can challenge that. They've also brought in. And I found this quite funny. It's almost like a VAR system. So instead of, like, you look at a challenge in soccer and they can point towards a penalty or something like that, it'll be pretty pretty similar in Formula One where they'll send it to a VAR system. VAR system. If a bloke, say, taking someone out and they haven't deemed it as a penalty worthy, they can go back, have a look at it, and then later down the track, give them a penalty. So... Um, 
they've brought some interesting changes for Formula One, and the big one is obviously the sacking of Michael Massey, which I think, yeah, as you said, Gratz, it's such a big and a big decision, such a mess that this just basically puts the cherry on top to say he made it wrong, and Hamilton should have won that race. Absolutely. I completely agree. That sort of justifies their anger. Yeah, I, 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 might, I um, meant to read a uh, message from uh, the uh, boss of Red Bull, uh, Christian Horner, basically saying, like, throwing his support behind um, behind uh, Massey, saying he should have been sacked because of the decision. So there are still people in Massey's corner over this move, and maybe these moves like uh, the VAR, and also believe that Massey's role has now been split into two, which we will also hopefully lead to less mistakes like this because let's be real, this thing has overshadowed which you as a F1 fan, Anthony, I hope I assume was a great season overall. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it for me it was um the theatre was there, it was so good. And witnessing it live, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. But then once you review it afterwards, for a season like it was to end that way, it probably all, it was almost in, inevitable that that was going to happen. But for it to end that way, to overshadow Max Verstappen's first championship, it kind of does take that emotion away a bit and put that frustration in. Um, but then again, I do see both sides of the argument. But as a Formula One lover, you just want everything to be fair game. And uh, that just wasn't the way to go about it. So it's unfortunate, but um, I'm glad they've sort of rectified the rules now and it's a little bit more clean cut and added some depth to other rules as well, which would make things a lot more clearer. And um, it'll also help other fans too. There was a lot of fans that were watching it that have never watched Formula One ever and just thinking, what the hell is going on? Mm. This was very... So, very confusing for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, uh, yet ironically, something like that with uh, pageantry and theatre that would actually, in my opinion, help encourage fans over to the sport because I, I recall myself, myself personally, and I'm not sure if you were similar, Hutto, I wanted to know everything about this event. Like, I was mm. just as captivated as you know your average diehard f1 fans over such a controversy because the theater the pageantry is what we're all attracted to it's why we love sports so much absolutely i completely agree yeah yeah um just finally before we uh we finish up boys the last race in abu dhabi formula one was the most watched sporting event of 2021 and even bet the Super Bowl that happened a couple of weeks ago, 108 million people watched it around the world compared to 101 that watched the Super Bowl. So it shows the magnitude that Formula One had going into that last race. And a lot of people got to see it. That's am- it's amazing. That's actually, yeah, it's actually an incredible stat to think about. Like One of the most over-the-top, crazy sort of sporting events of the year Yeah, for that to happen. Well... Speaking of over the top and crazy, we've been over the top and crazy tonight on the Wednesday whip around. So I will close this up. Jack Hudson, Thomas Graden, thank you very much for joining me tonight. And um, well, today, actually, it's a Wednesday whip around. But um, I look forward to uh, hearing from you guys across the sanctum. You can go, you can, everyone can go follow these two great gentlemen on Twitter as well and uh, keep up to date with everything they post. Hutto, any final words? Bring back the bars. <laughs> Grats, anything from you, mate? Let put Adelaide wear the bars. Ah, uh, this definitely wasn't set up at all. All right, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and follow everything in the sanctum across all your socials. My name's Anthony Alessiani, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.